I need you to understand something before we go any further. What I'm about to tell you isn't speculation, it isn't theory, and it most certainly isn't science fiction. Three days ago, NASA issued an internal directive that has never been issued in the 70-year history of space exploration. They suspended all deep space missions, every single one, and the reason why should terrify you. Before we begin, I need you to do something for me. Comment your city name below and tell me. Have you noticed anything unusual in the night sky lately? Anything at all? NASA is monitoring this more closely than you think, and your observation might be more critical than you realize. My name is Michio Kaku, and what I'm about to share may change the way you see humanity's place in the universe. Let me take you back to September 2019. That's when the Asteroid Terrestrial Impact Last Alert System, ATLAS, first detected something entering our solar system. We called it 3I Atlas. The I stands for interstellar, the third interstellar object we've ever observed. After Oumuamua and Borisov, we thought we were getting used to these cosmic visitors. We thought we understood the pattern, a rogue comet perhaps, or an asteroid ejected from some distant star system billions of years ago, drifting through the frozen void until it happened to pass through our little corner of the galaxy. We were wrong. I've spent my entire career studying the fundamental forces that govern our universe. I've written about parallel universes, about the fabric of space-time, about the theoretical possibilities of civilizations millions of years more advanced than our own, but I always approach these topics with the comfortable distance of mathematics and theory. I never expected to see the day when theory would collapse into reality with such brutal, undeniable force. The first anomaly came three weeks after 3I Atlas entered the heliosphere. The object was moving at approximately 26 kilometers per second relative to the sun. Unusual, but not unprecedented for an interstellar traveler. Its trajectory was hyperbolic, meaning it would swing around our sun and then shoot back out into the depths of space, never to return. Again, nothing we hadn't seen before, but then it changed course. Not dramatically. Not in a way that would make headlines, just a subtle deviation, a slight adjustment in its trajectory that could have been explained away as outgassing, the release of frozen volatiles as the object heated up approaching the sun. Every astronomer watching this object wanted to believe that explanation. I wanted to believe it. The problem was the math didn't work. The deviation was too precise, too controlled. It wasn't the chaotic, irregular thrust you'd expect from outgassing, it was a burn, a course correction. And that meant only one thing, propulsion. I remember the meeting at JPL where we first discussed this. The room was filled with some of the brightest minds in planetary science, and I watched the color drain from their faces as we worked through the calculations. Someone made a joke about aliens to break the tension, and nobody laughed. We all knew what we were looking at, even if none of us wanted to say it out loud. For six months, we tracked three I Atlas as it moved through the inner solar system. NASA mobilized every telescope, every observatory, every piece of detection equipment we had. The James Webb Space Telescope, Hubble, the Very Large Array in New Mexico, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in Chile, all of them focused on this single object. We needed to understand what it was, where it came from, and most importantly, what it wanted. The spectroscopic data came back first. The object's composition was unlike anything we'd ever seen. Not just unusual, but impossible, according to our current understanding of material science. The surface appeared to be a crystalline metallic structure with a melting point that exceeded 15,000 degrees Celsius. No known natural process could create such a material. This wasn't a rock. This wasn't a comet. This was something manufactured. I stood in my office that night looking up at the stars through my window, and I felt something I hadn't felt since I was a child. Fear. Pure existential fear. Because I realized in that moment that we, humanity, in all our pride and achievement, we were no longer the authors of our own story. We had become characters in someone else's narrative, and we didn't even know what role we were supposed to play. Then came the signal. It wasn't a radio transmission. It wasn't electromagnetic at all. It was something far more sophisticated, something we barely have the theoretical framework to understand. Our gravitational wave detectors at LIGO picked it up first, a rhythmic distortion 
motion in space-time itself emanating from 3i atlas. The pattern was mathematical, elegant, unmistakably artificial, prime numbers, Fibonacci sequences, the fundamental constants of physics expressed in a universal mathematical language. They were talking to us. I was brought into a classified briefing at NASA headquarters, along with a small group of physicists, linguists, and intelligence officials. The atmosphere in that room was unlike anything I've experienced. There was no excitement, no sense of historic discovery, just a heavy, suffocating dread, because embedded within that mathematical message was something else. Data. Vast amounts of data that our computers were still struggling to decode. But we got enough. We understood enough. The message wasn't a greeting. It was a warning. Let me try to explain what they told us, though I'm not sure human language has the words for it. According to the data stream, our galaxy, the Milky Way, is divided into zones. Regions of space designated by a galactic authority we never knew existed. These zones are not based on physical boundaries or political territories. They're based on evolutionary development, on consciousness, on what they called cognitive emergence. Earth, along with several dozen other star systems in our local region, exists within what they term a preservation zone. Think of it as a cosmic nature reserve. We are being observed, studied, protected, and most critically, isolated. The reason is simple and horrifying. We're not ready. Not ready for what, you might ask? Not ready for contact with the broader galactic civilization. Not ready for the technologies that would become available to us. Not ready for the philosophical and existential implications of learning our true place in the cosmic hierarchy. According to the message, species that are contacted too early, before they've achieved what the message called cognitive unity, tend to self-destruct, not eventually, quickly, within a single generation. The introduction of advanced technology and cosmic perspective to a species still caught in tribal thinking, still divided by borders and ideologies and primitive resource competition, is apparently fatal. Every single time. I think about this constantly. The Fermi paradox, the question of why, in a universe so vast and so old we've never detected any sign of intelligent life, suddenly has a terrifying answer. We're in a quarantine a galactic quarantine, and 3i Atlas is a monitoring station, checking in on the inhabitants of this isolated zone, making sure we're still safely contained. But here's what keeps me awake at night. Something has changed. 3 Atlas didn't just pass through our solar system delivering its message and moving on. It stopped three weeks ago at a position approximately 1.2 astronomical units beyond Jupiter's orbit. 3i Atlas came to a complete halt relative to the sun. It's just sitting there, waiting, watching. And that's when NASA made the decision. All deep space missions suspended. The Artemis program to return to the moon postponed indefinitely. The planned missions to Mars Cancelled. The probes we were preparing to send to Europa and Enceladus to search for life in the subsurface oceans of those moons shut down because we received a second message and this one was even more explicit. We have been issued what amounts to a cosmic restraining order. We are not to leave our immediate orbital space. We are not to establish any permanent presence beyond Earth. We are not to send any more signals into deep space. Any violation of these terms the message stated would result in corrective intervention. They didn't specify what that meant. They didn't have to. I've spent the last few weeks in consultation with government officials, military leaders, and fellow scientists trying to make sense of our options. And the reality we keep coming back to is this. We don't have any options. We are, technologically speaking, insects compared to whoever sent 3i Atlas. If they decided tomorrow that humanity had become too dangerous, too unstable, too much of a threat to spread beyond this planet, they could sterilize Earth without ever setting foot here. A relativistic projectile traveling at 90 90% the speed of light would impact our planet with the force of a billion nuclear weapons. We would never see it coming. Our entire civilization would be reduced to a thin layer of ash in the geological record. And the galaxy would continue on without us, never noticing we were gone. This is the reality we're living in now. We are not the pioneers we thought we were. We're not the brave explorers reaching out into the cosmic ocean. We're specimens in a terrarium 
being carefully managed by forces we cannot comprehend and cannot resist. But there's something else in the data, something that might be a thread of hope or might be the cruelest irony of all. The message indicated that the quarantine isn't permanent. Species can graduate from preservation zones, but only if they achieve cognitive unity, only if they transcend their tribal origins and become, in some fundamental way, a single consciousness, not a hive mind. The message was clear about that. Individuality is apparently essential to higher order cognition, but a species where every individual sees themselves as part of a larger whole, where cooperation overwhelms competition, where the survival of the many becomes indistinguishable from the survival of the one. How long do we have? The message didn't say, but it did provide examples of other species who made it through. The average time from technological emergence, that's the point where a species develops radio technology and nuclear weapons, to cognitive unity is approximately 300 years. Some species do it faster, many never do it at all. We're currently about 130 years into our window. I look at the state of our world today, the conflicts, the divisions, the inability to cooperate even in the face of existential threats like climate change and pandemic disease, and I wonder if we're going to make it. I wonder if the beings who sent 3i Atlas are watching us right now, running their calculations, updating their probability models for whether humanity will be one of the species that evolves or one of the species that destroys itself before it ever gets the chance. There's a term in evolutionary biology, the great filter. It's the idea that there must be some barrier, some extremely difficult step in the evolution of intelligent life that prevents civilizations from becoming galaxy-spanning empires. Some argue the great filter is behind us, that the emergence of life itself or consciousness or technology is so improbably difficult that we're lucky to be here at all. Others argue the great filter is ahead of us, some test that most civilizations fail. Now we know which one it is. The great filter isn't technological, it's psychological. It's the transition from seeing ourselves as separate tribes competing for limited resources to seeing ourselves as one species with a common destiny. It's learning to think in timescales longer than election cycles and quarterly earnings reports. It's developing the wisdom to match our power, and we're failing that test right now. I received a call last night from a colleague at SETI. She was in tears. She told me she'd spent her entire life searching for evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence, dreaming of the day when we'd finally make contact, when we'd finally know we weren't alone. And now that it's happened, now that we've received unambiguous proof that we're part of a galactic community, we've discovered that we're not invited to join. We're the neighbors nobody wants to talk to. The problem children who need to stay in their room until we learn to behave. The profound irony is that we've been shouting into the void for decades, beaming our radio signals into space, desperately hoping someone would hear us and respond. And they did hear us. They've been listening the whole time. They just chose not to respond because they were waiting to see if we'd grow up first. We didn't. NASA's suspension of deep space missions is being explained to the public as a budgetary issue, a reallocation of resources. That's the official story. And it's the story most people will believe because the truth is too strange, too disturbing, too fundamentally destructive to our self-image as a species. How do you tell 8 billion people that we're not ready for the stars, that we're being held back by our own psychological development, that the universe has looked at humanity and decided we need more time in isolation before we're allowed to play with the other civilizations. But some of you know something is wrong. Some of you have been watching the sky and noticing things that don't quite make sense. Lights that move in ways that defy conventional physics. Patterns in the stars that seem almost deliberate. That's why I asked you to comment your location at the beginning of this, because the monitoring has increased. 3i Atlas isn't alone anymore. Over the past two weeks, our long-range detection systems have identified at least 17 more objects entering the solar system on trajectories consistent with intelligent control. They're positioning themselves in a loose sphere around our sun, approximately two astronomical units out. A perimeter? A boundary? They're making sure we stay put. I think about the astronauts on the International Space Station right now, looking down at Earth, and I wonder what they're feeling. They're the farthest humans from home. 
Dome, our most distant representatives, and they're barely 400 kilometers above the surface. In cosmic terms, they haven't gone anywhere at all. We're all trapped here together, on this one small world, with all our problems and all our potential, trying to figure out how to become something worthy of the stars. The question that haunts me isn't whether we'll ever get to explore the galaxy, it's whether we deserve to. Because maybe they're right. Maybe a species that can't even achieve peace and cooperation on one planet with one atmosphere with one set of interconnected ecosystems has no business spreading to other worlds. Maybe we would be a plague on the galaxy, bringing our violence and our short-sightedness to every world we touched. Or maybe we're capable of more. Maybe this enforced isolation is exactly what we need. A pressure cooker that will force us to confront our own nature and choose consciously and deliberately to evolve beyond it. Maybe the next 170 years will be the most important in human history. The period where we either achieve the cognitive unity that will unlock the galaxy for us or destroy ourselves in nuclear fire and climate catastrophe and become just another failed experiment in the cosmic laboratory. I don't know which path will take. Nobody does. That's the terrifying beauty of free will. The outcome isn't predetermined. We get to choose what kind of species we become, but I do know this. They're watching. Right now, at this very moment, advanced intelligences with technology and perspective we can barely imagine are monitoring our every move, our every decision, waiting to see if we'll pass the test or fail it like so many species before us. 3i Atlas forced NASA to suspend all deep space missions because we've been told in no uncertain terms that our expansion into space is over until we prove we're ready for it. We're grounded and we'll stay grounded until we learn to see ourselves not as Americans or Chinese or Europeans or Africans, but as humans. Not as different religions or ideologies competing for dominance, but as one species with one future standing together at the threshold of either transcendence or extinction. The universe is waiting to see what we choose. I've been thinking about my grandchildren a lot lately. They're young, still in school, still dreaming about the future with that unburdened optimism that children have before the world teaches them to be cynical. What kind of world will they inherit? Will they grow up on a planet finally beginning to heal, finally learning to cooperate, finally taking those first tentative steps into a galactic community that welcomes us? Or will they inherit the ashes of a civilization that had everything it needed to succeed and squandered it on ancient hatreds and willful ignorance? I don't have the answer, none of us do. But I know the answer will be determined by the choices we make in the next few years, the next few decades. Every decision matters now. Every step toward toward unity or division, toward cooperation or competition, toward wisdom or short-sightedness is being weighed on a cosmic scale we're only beginning to understand. And they're watching us. They've always been watching us and they'll continue watching until we prove we're ready to join them or prove we never will be. So I'll ask you again, have you noticed anything unusual in the sky? Because this isn't just about scientific curiosity anymore. This is about understanding that we're part of something vastly larger than ourselves. Something that's been unfolding for billions of years across trillions of stars. And we're at a critical junction point in that cosmic story. Follow this channel as we continue decoding the universe's final warnings. Because this isn't over. This is just the beginning of a transformation that will either elevate us to the stars or confine us to this one small world until we fade into geological history and the universe moves on without us. The question I can't stop asking myself, the question that keeps me awake every night staring at the ceiling, is this. When the cosmic historians write the story of humanity thousands of years from now, will they write about us as the species that grew up, that learned wisdom, that earned their place among the stars? Or will we be a cautionary tale, a warning to other young civilizations about what happens when a species gains godlike technology without gaining godlike wisdom? What do you think? Are we capable of becoming what they need us to be? Drop your thoughts below because I genuinely want to know. Do you believe humanity can pass this test?